This week's episode is brought to you by Fairy Godmother Travel. Contact them at Communicore Weekly at FairyGodmotherTravel.com to book all of your Disney vacation needs. Again, that's FairyGodmotherTravel.com. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And it's a glorious day today. I know. I'm not used to recording Communicore Weekly when it's daylight. I know, right? We're, we're actually recording this on a different day than usual, so it feels like a whole different show. Like our whole vibe may be thrown off by this. Yeah, we had some weird time travel incidences. That's what we're calling it anyway. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. It's really yeah. weird to feel like the sun's shining on me while I'm recording an episode. <laughs> it's usually like, you know, the moon shining on me. I figured the sun was shining on you all the time in California, right? Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, because there's never bad weather here whatsoever. So it's just really bizarre. So hopefully it doesn't throw <laughs> off our whole, you know, r- rapport. R- repartee? R- rapport? Something like that. One of those two. I don't, One I don't of those know. words. Yeah. So We uh, could, could have called ourselves repartee weekly. Reptar? See, I, I almost said Reptar. <laughs> Reptar. Like, that's a different show altogether. That's the Rugrats, guys. And some of you may not even know what the Rugrats are. Oh, that's a shame. That's and a shame. Actually, so. we should record this so I can go watch the Rugrats movie now, because I really want to watch it. Okay, yeah, well, let's, let's jump into the history. History. It's time for Disney History. The California Institute of the Arts, also known as CalArts, is located in Valencia, California. The school was founded and created by Walt Disney in the early 1960s and staffed by a diverse array of professionals. Now, the institute was started as Disney dream of an interdisciplinary Caltech of the arts, and he really wanted Caltech to provide a collaborative environment for a diversity of uh, artists. And students were free to kind of develop their own work, over which they retain control and copyright, in this kind of like really interesting workshop atmosphere. And Walt Disney actually introduced the idea to the public at the Hollywood premiere of uh, Mary Poppins. So it was officially formed and incorporated in 1961 as a merger of the Chouinard Art Institute, which had been founded in 1921, and the Los Angeles Conservatory of Music, which had actually been founded in 1883. Both of the formerly existing institutions were going through financial difficulties around the same time, and the founder of the institute, Nelbert Chouinard, was also fatally ill. Now, the professional relationship between Madame Chouinard and Walt Disney began in 1929 when Disney had no money and Madame Chouinard agreed to train his first animators on a pay-later basis. And he never forgot over the years and watched the Chouinard Institute grow into the finest art school on the West Coast. It was through the vision of Disney who discovered and trained many of his studio artists at Chouinard, including Mary Blair and some of the Nine Old Men, that the merger of the two institutions was coordinated. The process continued after his death in 1966. Joining him were his brother, Roy O. Disney, Lulu Von Hagen, and Thornton Ladd of the Los Angeles Conservatory of Music. Now, in 1965, the Alumni Association was founded as a nonprofit organization and was governed by a 12-member board of directors to serve the best interests of the Institute and all of its programs. And members included leading per, uh, professional artists and musicians who contributed their knowledge uh, and their experience and their skills to kind of strengthen the Institute. Uh, the 12 founding uh, board of director members were Mary Costa, Edith Head, Gail Storm, Mark Davis, Tony DeCoit, uh, Harold Grieve, John Hench, Chuck Jones, Henry Mancini, Marty Payash, uh, Nelson Riddle, and Millard Sheets. Now, if you were listening, wow. you may hear some famous Disney names in there, too. Yeah, other animators and musicians and movie makers. Pretty impressive. So the, the groundbreaking for CalArts' current campus took place on May 3rd, 1969. However, construction of the new campus was hampered by torrential rains, labor troubles, and the earthquake of 71. So the quote-unquote new school began its first year in the buildings of Villa Cabrini Academy on Glen Oaks Boulevard, which was a former Catholic girls' school on the edge of downtown Burbank. 
I wonder, do they have to wear uniforms, you think? That would be kind of hilarious. That would be. Okay, so CalArts moved to its present campus in the Valencia section of the city of Santa Clarita, California, in November of 1971. From the beginning, CalArts was plagued by the tensions between its art and trade school functions. You know, it also had issues between the non-commercial aspirations of the students and faculty versus the conservative uh, interests of the Disney family and trustees. And the founding board of trustees originally planned on creating CalArts as a school in an entertainment complex, kind of like a destination place like Disneyland, and as a feeder school for the industry. Um, and they appointed Dr. Robert W. Corrigan as the first president of the institute. Corrigan, the former dean of the School of Arts at New York University, was attempting to create a similar mix of artistic disciplines as those that were going to be attempted at Cal Arts. Corrigan fired almost all the artists and teachers from Chouinard in his attempt to remake Cal Arts into his personal vision. He was joined the following year by his friend Herbert Blau, hired as the Institute's provost and dean of the School of Theater and Dance. Subsequently, Blau was instrumental in hiring a number of professionals like Mel Powell as the Dean of the School of Music and Paul Brock as the Dean of the School of Art, as well as other influential program heads and teachers such as uh, Stephen Von Huen, or Huen, Alan Capral, and more, most of whom largely came from a counterculture and the uh, like avant-garde side of the art world. The fundamental principles established at the Institute by uh, Blau and the late Corgan included ideas like no technique in advance of need, and that a curriculum should be uh, cler clerical rather than se sequential. Um, mm -hmm. You know, kind of returning to the root principles at regular intervals, and you know, they basically wanted to be a community of artists. And you know, some of us are called faculty, and some of us are called students. They wanted everyone <laughs> to kind of work together. So the faculty had like a big F on their shirts. Uh, are you talking about like the scarlet letter? That could be. Well, anyway, <laughs> that, that, see, obviously I shouldn't be designing school uniforms. Probably not. Probably not. So, so Corrigan held his position until 1972 when he was replaced by William S. Lund, Walt Disney's son-in-law, uh, also a Stanford graduate, uh, active in business, real estate, and economic counseling. Within a month of Lund's tenure as president, 55 of CalArts' 325 faculty and staff were fired. Uh, structured schedules were introduced, classes were trimmed back, and within a year, the Institute was operating on a budget. Some credit Lund with saving CalArts, others see his tenure as the end of an idealistic experiment. But in 1975, Robert J. Fitzpatrick was appointed new president of CalArts. Now, holding this position for 12 years, in 1987, Fitzpatrick resigned as president to head to Euro Disney in Paris. And then Nicholas England, former dean of the School of Music, was appointed acting president. One year later, Stephen D. Levine, the associate director of Arts and Humanities at the Rockefeller Foundation, was named the new president, and a position he actually still holds today. Uh, beginning in the summer of 1987, CalArts became the host of the state-funded California State Summer School for the Arts Program. It began by the state of California as a program to nurture talented high school students in the fields of animation, creative writing, dance, film and video, music, theater, and visual arts. CalArts expanded on the concept of creating the Community Arts Partnership in 1990. Now, while CSSA is open to qualifying California students, uh, CAP, as it is commonly known, is a service provided to students living within underprivileged communities in the Los Angeles County school system. And many CalArts faculty and students mentor the high school students in both programs. Over the years, the, the school has also developed on-campus interdisciplinary laboratories, such as the Center for Experiments in Art, Information, and Technology, the Center for Integrated Media, the Center for New Performance at CalArts, and the Kotzen Center for Puppetry and the Arts. In 1994, CalArts was damaged by the Northridge earthquake, and Michael Eisner, our BFF, he was actually on the <laughs> board of trustees at the time, and directed the real estate team at Disney to find a temporary site for the school. And all of the art programs were relocated to the Lockheed uh, Rye Canyon Research Facility for six months until the school itself was repaired. In that same year, Herb Alpert, a professional musician and admirer of the Institute, collaborated with CalArts with his nonprofit foundation to establish the Alpert Awards in the arts. While the foundation provides the award for winning recipients, the school's faculty in the fields of film and new media, visual arts, theater, dance, and music, selected artists in their field to nominate a, an individual artist who's recognized for the innovation, innovation in their given medium. 
Recipients of this award are required to stay for a week as visiting artists at CalArts and mentor students studying the same course as them. Huh, it's, it's I think that would be impressive. kind of fun to be forced to stay at CalArts for a week. I, well, I don't know if forced is the word I would use. I mean, they would have to force me off the campus at the end yeah. of it, I would think. Okay, because I said required to stay, but you know, it's it's, it's an impressive school. Oh, yeah, And one absolutely. of the Disney company has been involved with since the early 30s. As best we can say. Yes, yes. And it's, you know, I, I have not visited the campus yet, but I've seen photos of it, and it looks gorgeous. A lot of wonderful classes take place there. And, uh, I mean, if I had the money, I would go mm -hmm. to CalArts. And I don't even okay. like school. Just so you could have a Letterman's jacket there? Uh, yeah, yeah. From the, playing on the sports team or something I, I, like that? I would play on a sports team of CalArts because yay sports? I think so. Well, should mark. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any... Uh, if you spent time at Cal Arts or have any uh, relationship that, with them, we'd love to hear about it. Give us a call on the CommuniCore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. That's 424-785-GOAT. He's a nerd. He's a, nerd. He's a geek. He's a geek. But we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah. It's George's Book of the Week. So sometimes a book comes along and unexpectedly blows your mind. Never Built Los Angeles by Sam Lovell and Greg Golden is one of those books. Uh, I, I kept wishing for more of the book and, and for it to cover more than just Los Angeles and its environs. Um, but basically, this book is a catalog of the Los Angeles that could have been and almost was. It's basically like looking into the past and kind of seeing an alternate future that could have been. Like in Back to the Future Part 2, but with less gigantic buildings with Biff's, uh, Biff's face mm. on it. Um, you know, the book really does a great job of breaking down the what-ifs into sections and seeing what Los Angeles could have received had the support or funding or various other things have been there to help them be built to begin with. Yeah, I've always felt like I could have been an armchair architect, except I'm really, really bad at math, which is why Jeff is the CommuniCore Weekly accountant. Wait, I am? Yeah, you didn't know that? No. Oh. Well, that explains a lot. So, <laughs> anyway, um... <laughs> Besides being terrible at math, I, I, I did think that this book was amazing. It, it's really broken down into the different types of buildings or plans and, and offers ideas from well over a hundred different projects spanning Los Angeles' history. The authors uh, include uh, models, relevant models of it, plans, drawings, and anything else they could find in different archives. They also interview architects and critics about the projects sort of place them in an overall context. And not like they interviewed the ar architects that made the plans, but more modern architects that can act as a critique. Uh, it, it, it's more than just a look at what could have been, but sort of also what was happening in those areas as well. You know, for those of you who have seen the show, How I Met Your Mother, you know oh, I how- show. It, I love it. Well, love most it. of it, except for the last couple of seasons. Anyway. Well, don't ruin it. I'm not, I won't. Okay, okay. Uh, Ted kills Dumbledore. So. <sighs> The gang always tunes out Ted as soon as he starts talking about architecture because it's so boring. Because, you know, classic, classic Mosby. Anyway, <laughs> this book is like the complete opposite. If, if Ted was fun and exciting talking about architecture, that would be this book, basically. <laughs> um, it, you know, yeah. it manages to keep the material very accessible and interesting, and it's actually kind of fun. And I learned a lot from almost every single section I read, and it was pretty fascinated by all the stories behind the projects. Yeah, and it... it Besides just focusing on Los Angeles, you know, there were some sections, wow, some sections that, you know, Disney fans are uh, going to like as well. The uh, authors look at two potential world's fairs that were scheduled to take place in the area. The, of course, plans for early Disneyland, the Venice Amusement Pier, and the LA Zoo project. And there's a small section on Nat Weinkoff's Bible Storyland that's pretty telling. You know, Weinkoff, a former Disney executive, actually tapped Bruce Bushman to design most of the nascent park idea. And Bushman took many of the design ideas he learned from helping to design Disneyland to create the concept artwork, which is in there. Yeah, I, I really don't think we can say enough good things about this book. I mean, you know, from the early LA history to things as recent as, you know, just a few years ago, these projects really run the gauntlet of, like, just amazing things that we could have had. And, you know, sure, we were initially interested in the book for the theme park stuff, but we were absolutely blown away by everything else that was included in it. 
Yeah, the, the only thing I really wanted to see a lot more of the images in, in, a, in greater detail or more images, especially some of the larger urban plans. I, it, it, it's, it's really hard to stress just how cool the book is. And I would compare it to a look at sort of like Disney attractions that were never built or different jets and theme park ideas. It's, it's really got a lot of neat parts to it. So Never Built Los Angeles. It's one of those rare books that shows you a, a fanciful, but it, it really grounded, you know, look at some of the major projects in L.A. that could have changed the urban landscape forever. And not just L.A. We're talking probably across the world. It, it was almost like a well-built a well -built tease that has led me down several other paths, looking at how Walt might have designed Epcot had he lived a little longer. And it's obvious that Walt was paying a lot of attention to the issues and challenges of LA itself uh, and working them into his ideal community. Yeah, it's it's super weird to see stuff that Walt was talking about in his Epcot film, you know, in some form, make an appearance in the book. Um, I mean, it was very obvious he was influenced by surrounding areas of Los Angeles and it really shines through. Um, that said, I'm kind of glad that this stuff was never built because then we wouldn't be <laughs> able to read about it in this book. So uh, yeah. But really, for people who are interested in the history of Los Angeles and Hollywood, I mean, this book is a total yeah. win for them, I think. I think so. It's a, it's a great title for the history, looking at the whole area as a whole, and we both highly recommend it. Heck so yes. Go out and get a copy of Never Built Los Angeles by Sam Lovell and Greg Golden. Here's another minute that you can't get back. It's the 60 Decker Review. So I had never heard of Into the Woods before the release of the theatrical film during the last holiday season. Um, I know, I know, sounds like a shock. From the uh, advertising of it, you know, it looked like it was gonna be a pretty dark and frightening film. And I didn't see it in the theaters, but I knew we'd of course get a review copy. It's a Disney film, we'll send this one. But now I'm actually wishing that I'd seen it in the theaters or at least at one point in my life seen a live production of it. You know, your life isn't over. You can still see a live production of it still, right? Oh, I can? I thought once Disney put it on Blu-ray, that was it. No, no, I mean, it's still options. I mean, they're actually yeah. doing one around here. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. You know, I I actually have heard of Into the Woods before, and I've even been in the show before. Um, so I was kind of excited for it. I was a little concerned when Disney was announced they were making a film version, considering some of the more mature themes and undertones of the show. Um, but that said, after seeing it in the theaters, I was actually pleasantly surprised. Yeah, when I first heard that you were actually in the production, or in a production, I'm wondering what part was there for an air guitarist? There's plenty of parts for an air guitarist in Into the Woods. I'm just not going to tell you until oh. you see me do it again. So I see it do it again. Okay, well. So I was really, really surprised at how much I enjoyed this film. My youngest, who's 11, normally loves the superhero films, was really excited about it because he said, you know, based on the trailer that he saw. And he actually sat through and watched the entire film, despite the length and what I would call a slow pace, but it's not a slow pace in a bad way. Um, the, it, it was just, you know, shortly after the happy ending of the film that he seemed to get a little bit antsy, but, you know, I don't want to spoil anything. But overall, he did enjoy the film, and uh, we sort of found ourselves singing to each other for the rest of the evening, like, you know, I'm going to the kitchen to get some more snacks, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> um, and that lasted for about a day and a half. It is the last Pop-Tart. <laughs> stuff like that? Exactly. Awesome. So for those of you who don't know what the movie's about, it's kind of like the TV show Once Upon a Time in a way, but much better and with a lot more music. Um all the fairy tale characters that you know and love live near each other, and all their stories intertwine throughout the course of the film. Um, and it's it's just really, really good. We follow their stories as we normally remember them until all of their happy endings are achieved, and then when you think the story is over, it's not <laughs> over. It's not even close. You just reach the midpoint of the movie. Yeah, and that really surprised all of us because we didn't really know that was going to happen. Uh, I don't think it'll ruin anything because you guys know now, but it, it seemed like everything just worked out perfectly and... Well, we don't want to deal with spoilers at this point. You know, the movie was gorgeous. It sounded spectacular. And it, with a musical, of course, you need everything to be clear. You need the orchestration to come through without overwhelming the voices. You need the voices. You need to be able to hear what they're saying since that is the exposition of the plot. 
Um, but you know, everything, the voices were pristine, nothing seemed to overlap. Uh, and even though I had no basis for the musical, you know, for what to expect, I thought the casting was brilliant. I, so well done. Yeah, I agree. You know, even with me kind of being tired out <laughs> over Johnny Depp being in everything Shh, lately. Don't say that, he's listening. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Johnny. Um, <laughs> I kind of like how his role was confined to just that of the Big Bad Wolf here, because in the show, the actor who portrays the Big Bad Wolf, he actually portrays a few other roles as well, traditionally, but they only kept him in this one small part, which was good. Um, but that said, each of the casting choices worked really well. But to me, the standout was Meryl Streep because she was fantastic. Yeah, she was really, really good. And she made this role. I thought, you know, she really owned it. Uh, I did watch, you know, most of the extras, which focused on how they turned the musical into a film. And, and it really explained a lot, especially to someone uh, like me, who really isn't familiar with the, the show as it is. And there were also some regular extras, like how they did the casting, the costumes, and the sets. And those sets were impressive, because it was filmed a lot indoors, you know, in giant studios. Practical so. sets. Not, yes, pra is that what it's called? Not CGI sets. See, I don't, I don't go to a fancy film school, and I wouldn't know these things. See, I know these things. Sorry. See, that's why you have me <laughs> around, to tell you these things. <laughs> Um, and to act as our accountant. Yeah, that also, which I have okay. to get on, apparently, because okay. yeah. it's tax season. Um, so I did enjoy the commentary from the director-producer Rob Marshall and producer uh, John DeLuca, because they talked about bringing the original stage show to life for the screen. And it was kind of interesting to hear them talk about developing the language of the movie through song. And I also really liked uh, She'll Be Back, which was a deleted song that Stephen Sondheim wrote for Meryl Streep that was meant to follow Rapunzel's decision to leave the witch once and for all, but it was cut from the film. Um, but it was still cool to hear it. Yeah, I missed that one, so I'm going to have to go back and watch it now. But then I'll start singing again, and that might cause more problems. Anyways, <laughs> you know, I've, I've always, always been a big fan of the Disney musicals, uh, like Newsies and some of the other animated features. But my parents never really watched any while I was growing up. So uh, I'm experiencing a lot of them now as an adult, and of course sharing them with my kids. And I'm really... I'm, I'm, I've been surprised at how much I've been enjoying the musicals of all different types and periods. Uh, my wife had watched a lot, and she was introducing me to different ones as well. And, you know, if you've never experienced Into the Woods before, then I really urge you to pick up a copy. I mean, this is one I think you should buy. But, you know, if you're unsure, at least, you know, rent it first and then see if you like it. To me, as a theater nerd and a musical nerd, uh, this is a definite purchase. Uh, if nothing else, the... The duet with Chris Pine singing Agony is probably one of the funniest scenes <laughs> I have seen in a very long time. Oh, that was brilliant. So good. It was um, so perfect. The film was great. They did a wonderful job translating to the screen, and I love the music, so what is there to not like about it? Yeah, well, what about, you know, I heard they're making Frozen 2 Into the Woods. Um, no. Let's no? just go with no for that one. Okay. Just no. <laughs> Okay, so I guess that's a definite purchase from both of us then. Definite actually. purchase for into the go into the store to purchase into the woods right now. Awesome. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look what's that? It's a five-legged goat. Now, most of you know this already, but since we talked about Cal Arts in the history segment, it's only fitting that we talk about A113. Now, for you sharp-eyed viewers, you'll have noticed that A113 pops up in a lot of films. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you may remember it from most Pixar films, such as the license plate in Toy Story, or the camera model in Finding Nemo, and much more. But it's also hidden in plenty of other film and TV shows as well, such as The Simpsons, and South Park, and Rugrats, and even Doctor Who. Yep. Um, A113 actually refers to the classroom used by graphic design and character animation students, uh, including John Lasseter and Brad Bird. In fact, Brad Bird is credited for having used it first as a license plate in the Family Dog episode of Amazing Stories. You know, what can't Brad Bird do? Brad Bird can do whatever he wants to do, apparently. <laughs> like He's direct got a card. Tomorrowland. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. Or Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Starring in Tomorrowland. Well, maybe Mash he can. Mash up the so. two? Yeah, sure, we can oh, do that. We can do that. Sure. Okay. All right, well, before we uh, end the show, we want to announce this week's prize winner for the year of a million or so limited time cadets. Ta-da! Hooray! Right without saying it. Just remember, if you want to be part of this year-long celebration, just email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com. We just need your name, your address, because we have to mail out the prizes, and your birthday for other surprises as well. 
but this week's prize is a California Adventure prize pack sponsored by Fairy Godmother Travel. And this one is going out to Christine B. from Houston, Texas. Hooray! Hooray. Yeah. Yay! That's right. We need a crowd noise, don't we? We do. I should add that sound effect in, but I'm too lazy to. So let's just pretend it's going in here. Perfect. Oh, that sounded, sounded great. Perfect. Wonderful, that sounded great. guys. Didn't even blow the budget or anything. So Go team. <laughs> okay, go team. Well, thank you guys so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. Please leave us a comment wherever you watch or listen to the show, whether it's on YouTube or iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think about it. Yes, and email us at communicoreweekly at gmail.com. Not only to enter the contest, but just to tell us how awesome we are. Or say hey. Yeah, we like just saying hey. Yeah. Like us on the Facebook at facebook.com slash Communicore Weekly. We've been posting a lot of like vintage photos lately mm-hmm. from all the parks. It's, it's been kind of cool. It happened, yeah. And you can like us or follow us on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Imagine Nerding and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And of course, don't forget to call us on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424 785 4628. And visit communicoreweekly.com and click on the link for store where you can buy awesome t shirts and get your copy of Communicore Weekly, the musical. And of course, send us a self addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California 92856, and you can get your official cadet membership card and Communicore Weekly stickers. Yeah, those are awesome. And we've also put up some special videos and demos of songs and other cool things on our Patreon Patreon page. Just visit patreon.com slash Weekly and help support us. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Right.